and for you know scale, uh, this is five percent of uh, my module, or we can say five ten marks of this module, and uh, so the total you will be given ten marks, uh, and uh, there will be six questions. Uh, sorry, ten minutes, uh, and uh, you have six six questions, and out of it, basically, I will have only five as a uh, best performing. I will count only five. So uh, this quiz again will be for only ten minutes. So you are supposed to be in that particular uh, meeting, uh, your respective PA meeting. I will give you uh, basically all the instructions, detailed instructions soon. So at this moment, I am asking you know uh, if you have any questions regarding the quiz, then you can ask me. And after this, once I start the lecture, there won't be access. I won't be able to answer any questions. Okay, Sandeep. Uh, Thank you, sir. Labas will be till today's lecture also, right? I will announce everything. Uh, okay, okay. Any other question? Okay. Fine. So is it compulsory to attend all six questions or? Only the yeah, five one today counted for this. So you attend five, you attend six, doesn't matter. Only five will be there. You can attend three also, but uh, you know the other best three you will get passed for only three. So, so at what time will the quiz be? At the start or the at the end? Of the so you are from day three. You are uh, the time is basically you know the total time is two to three, right? Yes. So exact time start would be two o five, and it will end on two fifteen. So, as much as you can take from Moodle. Yes. Okay, next one. Mohit. 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 Okay, uh, I'm going to stop here then. Normally, the question is that I'm going to start the lecture. Can you can lower your hand? Yes. Uh, Will it be on say for Moodle? I just now it's on the Moodle. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to start the lecture now. So again, this is the last lecture of this module. Uh, the next lecture will be conducted by Professor Sridhar Nair. And in this particular uh, lecture, I am going to cover a lot of uh, information about genetic genetic part. So these are our uh, you know learning objectives. First, we'll talk about inherited DNA leads to specific cells. Then uh, DNA packaging, uh, and then how DNA basically can you know the information sorry information on DNA is being converted into protein. So what is this you know the exactly central dogma? And in central dogma, you have two sub processes. You can say the uh, transcription and translation. We'll talk about that. And if at all time permits, I will talk about genetic code and mutation. So first, and the question over here is uh, how the information is stored in DNA. So the, if you look into the uh, DNA structure, it is uh, you know double helix, and uh, you have the complement strand. So uh, there is specific, you know, uh, base pair will have, uh, you know, base pair will have specific interaction. Uh, for example, A will always have hydrogen bonding with uh, T, C will have hydrogen bonding with C, uh, C will be having hydrogen bonding with G, and so on. So you have uh, DNA, uh, this upper DNA running five times to the three times uh, this side, and the lower DNA is the same, exactly opposite, opposite direction. So this uh, double helix DNA has a uh, you know uh, particular direction. Uh, one will be uh, having you know that uh, this directionality is from let's uh, say right to left. Then the uh, the complementary direction, uh, complementary strand direction is from left to right. So uh, this is very uh, specific. And uh, when when you think about this particular sequence and you think about uh, its partner, and because uh, you know. There will be, you know, only one strand. So, you know, since we have the A, C, C, G, A, A, you can see this, uh, this uh, uh, sequence. You can see the complementary sequence as T, T, G, G, T. So, this is, you know, very uh, unique thing. 
and because of that it can store the information and that stored information uh, with the help of transcription and translation will get into format of the protein and that will be the last part of the lecture towards the last part of the lecture now uh, when you want to you know we have discussed about it uh, last lecture that you know the dnas are very specific in terms of copying so you have this two parental molecule or you can say two parental uh, strand and uh, this parental strand will separate into template and uh, in the next uh, generation of cycle also uh, what would happen is the uh, it would form new strand using the uh, template strand and the new strand will be complementary to the template strand um, but then the question over here during this uh, this process uh, you know when the new strands are uh, happening new new strands are being being created created with the help of the template strand are there any chances that there could be some errors and if at all there are errors then what could be the consequences so the answer to that question is very you know very uh, unique you can say because uh, first you have to think about the directionality uh, of the uh, synthesis so again uh, when the dna is the synthesized it gets synthesized in particular direction and that particular direction is from 5 prime end to 3 prime uh, end of uh, direction so when you think about this 5 prime and 3 prime so you have this uh, d of the uh, ribose sugar you can say over here and uh, when you think about the numbering uh, this is number 2 and at the second position is uh, uh, there is no oxygen and that is what uh, that is why it is called as d of the ribose ribonucleosis and the other ribosome and from there you have the uh, dna aspect you know, in common here so uh, there is a specific bonding uh, g will have a bonding with c c will have bonding with a and vice versa and because of that uh, it's very high specific but still there are some chances to have the errors and this when dna is basically being synthesized there is a special enzyme called dna polymerase which helps the dna synthesis and this particular uh, enzyme dna polymerase has uh, as well as it can synthesize as well as it has capability to check the errors during the uh, synthesis and so when you think about this particular uh, dna polymer uh, polymerase that particular enzyme can serve as your you know i mean if you have to consider an analogy that can be talk about as a you know pencil which can write or you know in this context it is synthesizing in the uh, 5m 3m direction and uh, as well as it can delete the uh, basically any error if at all there are some any any error uh, with the eraser it can be basically uh, Uh, the line let's say you have drawn something which is unmounted with the eraser it can be uh, yes similarly dna polymerase can check the error and uh, it has a, a, you know capacity to correct that uh, error so this polymer uh, dna polymerase is extremely important in terms of the dna synthesis but uh, if at all no let's say hypothetical question over here if at all there is a something goes wrong and uh, the still the error correction is not done then there is a mutation and this mutation could be either natural just because you know uh, it a uh, dna polymerase or some other uh, component of this uh, dna synthesis did not work and because of that uh, the uh, you know there could be mutation in such case uh, the mutation would be natural and then mutation could be also induced just like you know when you uh, you know when you basically sit uh, for long time uh, under x ray or under uv ray then it will change your genetic uh, uh, content because these are high energy radiation and that can break the bonds after breaking the bonds uh, you won't be having that particular interaction and that's why there are chances to have the mutation but apart from that there could be some mutation even though there, there are some mutations at few places but still it can be a silent it is not expressed or you know and with the silent mutation what will happen is the apparent effect on the organism is very much similar so uh, these are you know i mean uh, the mutation when you think about mutation uh, uh, you know it could be beneficial as well as it could be uh, it could have a drastic effect uh, but 
when you think about the mutants, uh, and uh, there is a general terminology which we come when you do the experiment, and this uh, during the experiment, always, always you will have a white type. What does this white type mean? What does this mutant mean? So, in this particular context, the wild type, uh, that would be a, a reference state organism. So, the organism which is in the native state, it has not been changed at all. And that would be your wild type. But, in case of mutant, organism might have gone under uh, some changes in the genetic makeup. And uh, a genetic makeup, uh, in terms of, you know, if you compare that uh, genetic, you know, uh, whatever the sequence with respect to the wild type, then it would be a mutant. And uh, the wild type, uh, you know, you can say the, it has a particular trait that are found in a population. Those are found in the population. So those are the three normal things which are being found in that particular, particular, particular population. That is called as a wild type. And whatever changes happen within the wild type, whatever the genetic changes happen within the wild type, that would lead to the mutant. So, uh, when you, you know, this terminology comes, wild type and mutant, you have to understand that wild type and mutant, these are two distinct, distinct organisms. Then when you think about wild type and mutant, uh, then again, uh, basically, these are with respect to the trait or with respect to a particular gene. And uh, the mutant can be, can have one or more genetic changes. It they totally depends uh, with reference to the wild, uh, wild type molecule or wild type organism. But now, uh, over here, to give you an analogy, I'm just showing you two pictures on the left. What you see is, uh, normal population uh, and it's you know within the population you can see there is a lot of diversity because each individual each individual has its own characteristics and those uh, will be because of you know uh, those will be very much uh, uh, relevant when uh, you reach to some uh, you know you can say uh, younger childhood also and uh, over uh, right side, what you see is uh, basically a series of X-Men, and uh, you have Wolverine, you have Magneto, and other characters are there. And uh, if you have seen this movie, uh, this movie uh, of the especially uh, from the X-Men, all these characters are called as mutants. So, in nutshell, this is your on the left side. This is your normal population that can be say, said as a Y type, and on the right side you have the mutants. Similarly, uh, in this particular picture, which is on your uh, uh, left side, uh, the upper one, what you see is you have the three deers, and among three deers, one is albino, and the other two uh, are basically brown. Those are uh, that, that is basically regular female uh, deer. And the lower picture, you have a raccoon, and in the raccoon, again, you know, the white one is an albino one. And the, it's a regular color, uh, is basically then a brownish also. So, uh, there are some, kind, you know, changes, uh, there are some mutations, uh, and because of those mutations, sometimes, uh, it, you know, the traits are very evident, sometimes traits are not that evident. And, uh, so, uh, when traits are not evident, you can say the mutation is silent. When trait is visible, uh, then you can say the uh, mutation is no more for silent. Just our case, in this case, uh, this is the color of normal uh, food fly, uh, which is red. And in case of, uh, you know, the mutant, uh, then, you know, you might have seen some uh, food fly which has white color eye. So the white color eye is basically uh, the uh, mutation and it is not seen very you know commonly. So uh, there is some variation and uh, in this particular case, uh, this the red color uh, food fly will called as a wild type and the uh, white color uh, eye uh, that that food fly that will called as a mutant. Now when you think about uh, you know. Uh, Cell division uh, and last method what we learn is uh, the there are two specific cells uh, in context of that and uh, each cell will have two particular you can say pathways to uh, have the uh, production of cells. 
uh, one is meiosis, other is mitosis. And basis of that, we will have uh, we applied all the platform. But um, when you know, uh, in terms of re uh, reproduction, you see that uh, the general term being used as gamete. Or those are, you know, cells which are being useful for the uh, reproduction. And the other category is the somatic cells. So somatic cells are, again, uh, when you think about it, it is very helpful in terms of uh, uh, mentoring your uh, wear and tear, replacing the few, uh, few cells uh, which are constantly uh, getting replenished. <coughs> but in an organism, when the mutation has to be transmitted, that will get transmitted only to the mutations in the germ cell and not in the somatic cell. So uh, then, you know, uh, what is exactly this genetic makeup and uh, how does it, uh, you know, basically uh, reveal the trait, particular trait? So based on the genetic makeup, you have a terminology called as genotype. So genotype is a terminology where you can say uh, the, it's a genetic content of an organism. And on this basis of genetic content, uh, the genotype will express a particular trait. And this particular trait could be, let's say, the color of the organism, hair of the organism, eye color, or something else. And the visible trait, those are, you know, visible trait, direct observable trait. And those uh, traits are basically inherited. And that is called as a phenotype. But other question is, how does the information from phenotype to phenotype is being studied? And what is exactly the mechanism behind it? And that's, you know, kind of a little hard to answer question back in, back in those days where, you know, the uh, uh, scientists just started learning about the, uh, the gene and all those things. So, uh, in, in that perspective, uh, you know, uh, this uh, particular physician, uh, Dr. Gerard, uh, what he did is he basically uh, identified some diseases called as Alzheimer's. And this particular alpha proton uh, is uh, present in everyone's body. And with that alpha proton, uh, what happens is your urea, uh, sorry, it's, uh, your uh, urine, uh, it looks black. And to convert that into the yellow color, there is a specific metabolism uh, involved over there. And there is a specific enzyme that is called as alpha proton. Uh, so basically, uh, that particular enzyme will, uh, you know, convert the cytopton to the uh, yellow color. And uh, if someone doesn't have that particular enzyme, then the color will remain black. And this could be an inborn error of metabolism. So this kind of, you know, the first finding the term, inborn error of metabolism, without knowing exactly the situation over there. Uh, the, the, the system. And with that, uh, you know, uh, one can see that Dr. Gerard was really ahead of, of his time. And this is in, you know, can say late 80s and early 90s. So it's, uh, you know, almost uh, 100 years back, more than 100 years back. So um, another, you know, the, some of the examples, you know, uh, in order to understand genotype to phenotype and all those things, uh, there is one more person whose uh, contribution is exemplary, and that person's name is uh, Gregor Mendel. And in particular, Gregor Mendel's principles of heredity apply to uh, human as well. So he had, you know, a very beautiful set of experiments, and those experiments basically gave us idea uh, how the, the gene is being passed from one generation to the other generation. In this particular diagram over here, what you see, the signal line is basically getting converted into maliceoacetonic uh, uh, acetic acid. So, uh, if at all it is not yet being converted, then uh, you can say it is a disease and uh, it will require a particular uh, metabolite which has to uh, be there in the, in the body. If at all your body does not have it, then uh, you have that disease. So what uh, you know one can confirm over here is gene will dictate the production of a particular uh, enzyme 
and uh, cell synthesis or degradation of organic or molecule uh, can be you know that can be done by uh, metabolic pathways and is uh, chemical re reaction involved in this metabolic pathway is catalyzed by particular specific enzyme so uh, then you know the, the question over here is uh, what is the relation between the genes and enzyme how these two are related to each other and again back in 1800 uh, you know you didn't had uh, much means to uh, interpret the data uh, you, you don't have much means to collect the data uh, what data has to be collected and uh, you know as such the concept of gene at that time was evolving um but then when you think about uh, the particular trait uh, the genes you know uh, which are basically responsible uh, these are you know some list so there is you know gene can be responsible for color code of animal which is like you know the it has to change the green it has it, it has to have some kind of stripe or so so all those things all those things are basically code color and uh, the in particular uh, so basically the uh, color of the uh, eye in drosophila so white uh, white eye is a basically a rare genetic uh, you can say uh, you know thing and uh, white white eyes in the uh, drosophila and then uh, other you know uh, basically we talked about this uh, black urine in alcopotomia with the natural disease but then the question is uh, what exactly gene this gene do and uh, in order to understand these genes and then you know there were many experiments were conducted but the major progress major progress in this kind of you know, detecting or you can say uh, finding the relationship between the genes and enzyme that uh, came you know with this two gentlemen uh, and uh, uh, with the George Bedel and uh, George Little and uh, Edward Totham So these two gentlemen basically work on uh, cancer mold, which is a neurospora cancer, and this is a mold which is can be seen now on the bread. Um, and what they, you know, what they did is they took uh, the wild type where nothing is being seen, and uh, they uh, also, you know, so they. Uh, um ask series of questions and uh, in that basically uh, their approach was little different and uh, the, at that time uh, the biggest question was uh, how the genes are responsible for particular phenotype and how the particular phenotype can be observed uh, with the genes instead of asking this question what they try to understand is they wanted to understand what is this gene which controls this reaction so it's a little different of and in order to you know have that answer what they did is you uh, they basically uh, took this uh, neurospark data and uh, you uh, they basically exposed to two kinds of medium one is minimal medium other is complete medium so minimal medium is basically a medium where uh, it has some inorganic salts the glucose biotin and uh, you have the agar as a solution support also or support media support media but then um, this minimal medium which, which which will have you know the only uh, small amount of uh, nutrition and the rest of the nutrition will be biosynthesized by this neurospora neuro, neuro the best thing about neurospora is it requires uh, you know less amount of uh, uh, you can say uh, molecules to survive so whatever the biosynthesis or whatever the biosynthesis happens biosynthesis happens inside the neurospora it is not like uh, very expensive it is very small and that way it can manage to synthesize few molecules by itself and uh, go for the uh, it's a metabolic activity and so and when you think about the complete medium the complete medium will consist of everything uh, or it will have the minimal media it will have the extra things the extra thing could be uh, you know amino acids some uh, few other nutrients and those nutrients could be uh, iron this would be important towards the growth and uh, what they observed 
that uh, wild type neospora can grow even in animal moon media. And there were you know couple of uh, instances uh, where uh, the minimal you know with the minimal media the, uh, this particular plant or this particular fungi did not survive. So uh, what what was I mean all those things? I mean well, you know what they did is uh, they had the wild type plant and they had the uh, mutant plant, uh, mutant mutant plant, and these mutant mutant plants were ob obtained by uh, exposing it to the uh, X-ray, and this X-ray will change the genetic makeup, and that is how they uh, got their mutant. And uh, after getting the mutant, they isolated this, and then uh, they saw that it is unable to survive in minimal media, which is having very few nutrients. Very required attention. So this is where you know workflow. The, you know the wild type is there. From wild type they have the X-ray, and from the X-ray then you know they they got uh, they got uh, to see the both ends. In one end you can see there is a complete when you have this mutant and you provide the complete medium, there is a growth. And when you have a minimal medium, there is no growth. So it's a very you know interesting uh, observation. And uh, then you know they did a series of the experiments over there. And in this particular series, uh, you know, in this particular uh, example, what you see is uh, on the picture uh, on the right side, there are two test tubes. And two test tubes, one test tube has the control media, which is uh, uh, minimal media, and uh, uh, other is basically uh, complete media. And uh, what they see is uh, when you put the mutant in the uh, you know minimal media, uh, so then there is no growth. And wild type can have the growth in the minimal media also. So uh, there was an interference that uh, from this experiment that mutant is not able to synthesize one or more species components. And uh, because you know in the minimal media there is not much uh, growth uh, of the uh, mutant. Uh, so then what they did is they prepared different vials and uh, different vials have different composition in the minimal media. So just you know uh, in the first uh, it is minimal media along with component 1 then you know component 2 and so on. And uh, in some cases you will see you, they notice you know there is uh, a growth and in some other cases there is no growth. So then uh, you know uh, so in, in particular, they were interested in arginine biosynthesis, and their work was being followed by uh, other two colleagues of them, um, and uh, they basically uh, invested further so that the names are uh, Adrian Serb and Norman House uh, Orwell. So what they tried to do is they wanted to see the synthesis of uh, arginine. And this uh, synthesis of arginine, you have different reactions. And at each stage of reaction, uh, you can say there is uh, some kind of activity has to be done. And this activity can be uh, governed by particular enzymes. For example, precursor to onithin. That, you know, the, the reaction is being catalyzed by, let's say, enzyme A. The onithin to citrulline, that reaction is being catalyzed by enzyme D. And the third one, citrulline to arginine, that reaction is catalyzed by enzyme C. And so on. So, um, uh, the, you know, this is the, uh, you can say the pathway and uh, when you think about the arginine, arginine is, uh, you know, one of the, uh, you know, 20 amino acids that, you know, from there, you know, the possible combination from, you know, the all possible combinations of the amino acids that would, uh, uh, you know, have uh, various possibilities and uh, uh, there would be a polypeptide because of the polypeptide that particular protein can be there. Now coming back to their experiments and uh, what we see this is the first column and in first column they have the wild type and uh, you have the first row is basically you have the minimal media. Second row you have the minimal media plus one chemical that is called as only time. The second, third row is Minimal media with the citrulline and fourth is minimal media plus arginine. And now, when you look into this result, uh, the wild type over here. So, no matter it is a minimal media with or without uh, uh, this uh, particular chemical, uh, still uh, with the wild type there is a growth. 
But when you think about the army bands, class one, class two, class three, uh, at you know at least you know one instance you can see there is no growth. So for example, you just have the minimum media, and there is no growth in the class one. But then when you have the minimum media along with only time, there is a uh, you know expression of the army bands. Uh, similarly, uh, over here you know whenever you see this uh, yellow band, that means there is a expression. But uh, in the other mutants, what they saw is even they, you know, uh, you add some media, still uh, the, uh, you know, after adding the media, still uh, the, there is no growth. Oh, sorry, the uh, medium, uh, minimum media along with the few components. Uh, and you see, uh, in particular, this uh, uh, this uh, column. In this particular column, what you see, the first, the uh, there is no growth. And the last one, there is a growth. So, what that concerns? I mean, what is the summary about? Uh, with the this, you know, column, what we can say that uh, it can grow with uh, or without any supplement. This particular uh, wild type. But when it comes to the class one mutant, it can grow on only thin, uh, citrusin and arginine. All three are required, and that's how it can uh, produce the arginine. This, you know, the second mutant. Uh, has only citrulline and arginine. So, um, uh, if you have the minimal media plus only thing, then there is no growth. But then it requires uh, other two components. Uh, the third one is, you know, it is only seen with the presence of, uh, uh, you know, the minimal media along with the, uh, this arginine. So, what that means that, you know, this particular, uh, you know, this particular tail group, or, uh, it will require arginine to grow. No matter, without there is, let's say there is no arginine, then uh, there won't be a growth. So, with that experiment, uh, we can basically uh, interpret with this, uh, that, you know, in the case of class 1 mutation, this precursor to only that, uh, that particular reaction is being inhibited. In the second case, this conversion to citrulline that has been inhibited, and the third one, citrulline to arginine, that has been, uh, you know, uh, not happening. So th those were, you know, overall uh, the experiments, and uh, uh, you know, in that in that way, the people thought how the gene is related, and uh, what is exactly the relevance, and uh, when uh, this was ended, gentlemen, uh, when they proposed that gene is indeed uh, genetic material also. Uh, at that time, uh, this uh, Edward Patton and uh, George uh, Middle over there, they, what they um, what they uh, propose that each gene will have the um, that one one gene will correspond for one enzyme. But then, you know, with the later on evidences and all those things, uh, it was later confirmed that that's not the case. And uh, from one gene to one enzyme, uh, the theory got modified. And uh, from one gene to current theory is one gene, one uh, polypeptide. So, but in particularly, yeah, this is what, you know, uh, the initially before the hypothesis, one gene, one protein, or one gene, one enzyme, you can say. And, uh, but then when you think about uh, the protein, uh, at the times, you know, uh, they have several polypeptides and uh, each polypeptide will have its own gene. Then that was the case, in that case, uh, the original hypothesis uh, by Middle and Cotton was uh, changed and uh, then it was basically said that one gene will have one polypeptide. So, uh, when you think about the uh, chromosomes and genes, again, you know, the chromosome is nothing but uh, you can say uh, compact form or dense form of the DNA. Uh, but, you know, when you think about the traits which are being inherited, then uh, the, it could be related to color, it could be related to shape, it could be related to some kind of size. So, it's, it's uh, you know, various things which are related to the genes. So, for example, uh, uh, you know the uh, human eye color that is uh, you can uh, you can say that is inherited uh, uh, information, and uh, or you know it is being uh, expressed uh, in the offspring, and depending upon the color of the parents, that would get uh, decided. 
and uh, you know to observe you know this basically uh, those you know the, those are observable traits the color shape uh, you know the, these are particular uh, characteristics and those uh, you know uh, basically one of the first experiments uh, were done to understand the relation between so called gene and trait that were done by gregor mendel and then uh, you know it was followed by in case of gregor mendel he experimented with the pea plant and uh, other person thomas morgan he experimented with the fruit fly um so uh, when we think about the mendel contribution it's a very amazing whatever he did at that time it was back in 1800 amazing thing very amazing thing so and then his work was uh, you know remained unnoticed for long time um so uh, in this particular uh, experiment uh, what uh, it is called as law of segregation and what he did is he took fewer uh, true breeding uh, plant and in this you know we, one breeding plant has a purple uh, flower color the other has white flower color and then he basically went for the cross breed between them and in the first generation that is called as f1 generation c generation is basically parent generation f1 generation that is called as you know first offspring uh, which is obtained by the parent generation and in that particular generation what you see is you have all plants in the purple so basically uh, the white color over there is not seen at all then you know uh, the purple color color is over here and then again see the city went for the self uh, you can say uh, pollination or self you know pollination between these uh, uh, purple color flowers plant and uh, in this next subsequent generation that is f2 generation or second generation what you saw like he had approximately three purple flower plant uh, versus one white flower plant that is like you know kind of intriguing and then from this statement what is thought that there are some uh, heritable factors and you know the heritable factors uh, there are some traits so uh, uh, and some traits are recessive that is not being expressed and some traits are dominant and the, if at all there is a combination between dominant and uh, recessive traits if that is the combination within the gamete then only uh, you know only dominant trait is being expressed so which is you know very uh, you know really uh, good observation and uh, at the time uh, he called you know this gene at that time he called them called them as allele a l l e l e allele and uh, See, what he said is that you know it will this allele will determine the uh, organism's appearance, and uh, you know the dominant will show up always if at all there is you know mixture of dominant versus recessive trait or recessive allele, and the recessive allele will have will have no significant uh, you know or you can say it will have no noticeable effect on the organism's appearance. so uh, when you think about this f2 generation and uh, totally he could see you know total somewhere about 705 purple flowers plants and the white at 224 so this particular ratio is 1 x 2 3 or 3 x 2 basically three purple per three purple flowers and uh, for each three purple flower there will be one white flower this is you know kind of approximate uh, you can say ratio and uh, when you want to think about the uh, you know the, this particular law law of segregation and uh, when you want to think about uh, the gene let's say the purple flower gene uh, and now we will let you know think about the gamete so uh, here the true breeding uh, breeding plant let's say the purple one that has genotype let's say that gene or allele uh, you can say that is in uh capital pp and the white one has small pp because this is a recessive this is dominant and this is you know the way of uh, writing and then when you think about the gamete gamete will be always haploid so this is a diploid a diploid form and uh, the gamete will be haploid form this is what we discussed in the last lecture 
and in case of uh, purple flower this is uh, capital c in case of uh, white flower this is lower c lower c or small c and now when you have the first generation then what you what you should have is half of the uh, flower should have uh, you know this uh, you know purple and half of should be have a white but instead of that what you see the you have uh, let's say the you know the complete form after uh, the gamete formation and all the things the, in this particular uh, equine generation you will have this genotype uh, pp but even though the pp is there still the color is uh, you know the capital p and small p the color is still purple so in this case the dominant trait is being uh, is getting basically expressed and the recessive trait is not getting expressed but now when you think about the f2 generation over there and over there you know what we did is what we did is we took uh, you know the sperm from the can say the f1 generation and the x from the f1 generation. this is called you can say self pollination also and if you think about you know the uh, you know arrangement uh, this particular uh, box or this particular square it is called as punnett square and this punnett square will show the combination of all alleles in the offspring uh, and then you know then what you want to do is we want to basically uh, you have the this particular uh, pp and this pp and what you do is you just write here and then you take the combination so in particular let's say for this particular uh, element over here in this matrix or uh, in this square uh, the matrix uh, in this matrix this particular element i can write the combination of the capital p over here and capital p from here the next one the capital p from here and small p p from here and for this particular uh, element i will take the capital p from here and small p from here and in these two cases uh, capital p and small p that would have a dominant effect because of uh, the the dominant trait will get uh, expressed and uh, that way uh, from this particular uh, you know probability or uh, this particular uh, possible combination what i can predict that there would be three purple flowers and one white flower and that is what exactly uh, gregor mendel saw and in his, in his case basically uh, you can think that whatever he did that was just um, uh, you can say that was uh, Uh, you know pure experiment and she did not you know she uh, did not calculate this stuff for the basis but then the later on the other science scientists uh, uh, and that is why this uh, square is uh, called as smith square um she basically try to uh, make sense in terms of uh, you know the probabilities and all these things and uh, with this combination over here uh, what we can see the the combination of these gametes i will result in 3 to 1 ratio of uh, f2 generation and this is what exactly the mendel observed in the great law uh, or next observation of the mendel was again astonishing so next law is called as law of independent assortment and in that particular experiment what he did is he basically took two traits and here two traits over here in this case what you see is this is the yellow thread which has a round shape and the other uh, is basically a uh, green uh, thread with the wrinkled shape the gamete of this one the uh, yellow and brown that would can that can be written as capital y capital r the gamete of the uh, green and wrinkled that can be written as small y uh small r and then you basically take this uh, you know the uh, cross breeding between these two gametes and the cross breeding should have the expression of y capital y small y capital r small r and in this particular case since the dominating dominating trait in, in color that is gray uh, that is yellow and dominating trait is the round so even though you have the combinations of uh, this thing still you see over here 
um, you have the uh, the round shape. So in this particular case, the both threads which are being dominant that is being expressed. Now the question over here is when we thought if you have two threads, what should be the uh, lineage look like or the S2 generation look like? And if at all the two threads are independent, then the, the ratio should be different, phenotypic ratio should be different. Phenotype, you remember that, that is the Assyrian. So if at all, uh, if, you know, the hypothesis, uh, let's say the two uh, threads are dependent on each other, then he should have seen the phenotype, phenotypic ratio of T21. So in that case, what would have happened is you have the uh, gametes capital Y, capital R, uh, half of the gametes like that, and half of the gametes will have small y, small r, and over here. And in that case, you would have seen this result. So three, two, uh, you know, one. So the three will have uh, uh, yellow and uh, round shape, and one will have uh, wrinkle and green color. But then, uh, in his case, what we saw in the second uh, uh, generation over here, he saw that uh, there are 315 rounds and uh, yellow uh, fields, then you have uh, green uh, color, uh, round, green and brown, that is the C108, then wrinkle and yellow, those are 101, and uh, green wrinkle, by which both traits are uh, recessive, that is being recessive. And now, when you want to basically uh, think about the this hypothesis as independent, then in that case, your firm gametes will be written like this, all possible combinations over here, and similar for the L. And now, then you want to basically take this, uh, you know, uh, combinations of this uh, sperms and gametes in particular row and uh, that particular uh, uh, column. And then over here, what you see is out of, you know, basically nine, will out of 16 basically, this is basically probability and in this particular, particular probability you will see the ratio, phenotypic ratio will be 9 as to 3 as to 3 as to 1 and this you know the 9 will have uh, yellow and round shape, the 3 will have green and round shape, 3 will have uh, wrinkle shape and yellow color and 1 will have wrinkle shape and green color and this is what exactly Mendel saw. And that is why it is basically, what we said is two traits are not being uh, basically dependent, they are independent. Um, so this is what basically uh, the second law of uh, Mendel uh, said. The two traits are uh, somehow uh, phenotypic traits, they are, they, are, they are independent. And now uh, in our, you know, the next objective is about DNA packaging uh, and how exactly these things are being accessed in terms of the genes and other things. It's a very much similar to library and uh, when you think about the library, you have, you know, different cells and different cells, you have uh, compartments and all those things. This is what you can think about the chromosome itself or DNA packaging. So again, when you, you know, think about the DNA and uh, just to give you some kind of, uh, you know, uh, idea, you can you can think about DNA uh, and uh, the uh, uh, dimension. You know, uh, last uh, lecture we discussed about the dimensions of DNA. So you have ten base pairs. Uh, the ten base pair distance is 3.4 nanometer, which means one uh, you know base pair will have distance of uh, 0.34 nanometer. And uh, you remember that there are 23 chromosomes in the human, and if you take Chromosome number one, it has approximately 250 million base pairs. And now if I have to calculate how much that length would be, that length would be 250 times 10, uh, 250 times 10 to power 6 times 0.34 nanometer. And that would be roughly 85 uh, millimeter. Of. But here is the thing, 85 millimeter, which is, you can say 8.5 centimeter almost like you are, you know, the, you are small scale. So it is that, that basically, you know, you can say 8.5 uh, centimeter, which is too uh, visibly seen. But when you think about the cells, cells always not, you know, uh, seen with the naked eye. And when you think about the eukaryotic cell, the distance, uh, the dimension eukaryotic cell will have some micron size. 
but now you compare you know you have the dna of this lens is 0.5 cm you know inside that micro micron size uh, cell how does that happen which means i mean the dna has to be have some kind of compact form uh, it has to have you know lot of uh, other things over in one of that now when you think about the organization of the dna into the chromosome this is how the it, it looks hmm. so on the first level over here you have the ribbon model which is the c double helical structure and the beads of that double helical structure is 2 nanometer in that and uh, the base pair that we know you know the one helical turn has 10 base pair and that is the specific point for nanometer of it now uh, what happens is this dna the first packing is the uh, due to the uh, basically something called as chromatin and uh, the first level packing of dna in the chromatin would be uh, some proteins are involved over there and those proteins are nothing but um histones over here so these histones will interact and then you know you will get this kind of uh, uh, step so dna is getting wrapped wrap around this histones and you know histones has some tail and you can say there is a uh, ball shape and uh, the, you know some histones will come together they will get binded and uh, along with that uh, you have this uh, dna wrapped around and you know then you know you have uh, that particular structure then uh, dna is bound uh, or wrapped around this uh, system that is called as nucleus and you know in the second level of uh, packing so basically this histone will interact and uh, interact with the histone cells also and then it will make uh, this uh, this kind of structure so it will make uh, this fiber structure which will have uh, you know the width of you can say 30 nanometer or so and this is the fiber you can see first level over here uh, the dna is getting wrapped around this histone again you know the histone is basically again uh, you can say it takes uh, some kind of spiral form Uh, or file form over here that makes the fiber and the width of that fiber could be typically of the order of uh, 30 nanometer then further uh, you know this histones you can say they are coiled in this manner in this basically scaffolding uh, manner and that basically scaffold over here that width is 300 nanometer so uh, don't get you know these are not actual dimensions over here uh, the you know the dimension over here you see 30 nanometer and over here you see 300 nanometer so that you know the actual is you know basically you are saying you know the uh, the compressed version of uh, this or, or you can say from this point you are you are seeing the uh, magnified uh, version and from this point you are seeing the magnified form of uh, dna uh, over here and then you know at the end over here the 300 nanometer fiber that is the basically you know that is what the, the chromatin is made for and this you know this is the chromosome these are two two system chromatids and uh, that is how it is packed but then if you remember the chromosome that appears only uh, time of cell division otherwise it doesn't appear and uh, otherwise you know it is in some different form um so uh, when you think about uh, accessing this dna uh, you know there has to be some kind of uh, you know some kind of central library or just like you know when you want to access some books inside the library there is some kind of code and uh, you know you have to look into that particular code and then you will go to this particular cells to look for it so similarly you know in in case of you know finding the gene on the uh, chromosome or on the uh, this uh, you know chromatin the same similar process you can say uh, or i'm just giving you analogy so very similar way and over there um, uh, you need to locate uh, you need to locate uh, and those locations are uh, very unique uh, and uh, during the metabolic activity uh, the genes are basically located and with that uh, with the help of uh, you know those particular genes particular enzymes particular protein can be expressed 
but uh, when you think about the you know accessing uh, you know the, the dna by default will have it's a, a very complex com you know a compact structure you know, you can say and uh, there are you know the two terminologies over here when it is accessible uh, that basically it is called as euchromatin and in, in case of euchromatin the uh, dna or this particular chromatin is discrete less compact and it will have accessible form so over here just you know you can see the uh, the the depiction over here you can see these histones are there and in between histones there is a some distance gap or gap is there so those could be basically nothing but you have you know some you know some chance for the interaction with the gene and with that you are able to get the uh, you know whatever the location you can you can able to uh get the get, get the proper location and then uh, you are once you get the access to the gene then particular protein can be expressed but uh, the other form is heterochromatin which is basically a very compact form and in that that compact form you cannot have access to the gene so again you know you think about this chromosome and uh, inside cell you no know, Uh, inside cell again there are 23 chromosomes but this chromosomes um, are in this pair so for each each chromosome will have its a pair so there are basically uh, you know except uh, 23rd but then 23rd in case of female that xs uh, xx uh, chromosome and in case of male it is xy and uh, in the cell all these basically chromosomes are spread out and uh, when you just want to feel you know this is basically a fluorescent uh, image and uh, this is arranged you can say these are you know chromosomes are arranged into the uh, karyotype but inside cell it is you know very different structure and uh, when you know cell is undergoing the cell division process uh, then uh, the chromosome will basically look like this otherwise it is you know mostly this tangles uh, this array and then you can see so you know a lot of blurry image over here so this is how the uh, chromosome will look like in the normal cell and the next uh, will you know talk about this uh, dna to protein and uh, we'll talk about the basic principles of the transcription transcription now i uh, hear you know uh, let's say you know what we learn so far is uh, there is some and how exactly that information is being translated into you know how exactly that ends up in getting the protein uh, expressed in cell this cell so that is the whole process called as central dogma and uh, within that you have different uh, sub processes the first process over here is you basically get a transcription and this transcription is nothing but synthesis of rna molecule using the information from dna now you may ask me what is rna now rna and dna they are essentially you can say very similar molecules now in case of rna if you remember that sugar base we we talked about this sugar base over here and this is d of the ribose okay and at the second uh, location over here the two prime location here oxygen is not there this is a hydroxyl group over here in the third location and when the uh, the at uh, the two prime location there is a hydroxyl group then that would be a ribose and from the hydroxyl group if you don't have that hydroxyl group hydroxyl hydroxyl group you have just hydrogen over there then it is called as d or g ribose that is the one of the difference and the other difference over there is um you have you know a different purine and pyrimidine so in case of uh, uh, in case of dna you have a t c g and in case of rna you have a u g c again when you think about this purine and pyrimidine in case of dna 
you have a t c g and in case of rna you have a u g c instead of thymine there would be c r these are particular you know two differences in case of rna and dna and even rna will have the backbone of uh, the phosphate molecule going back to our point about the transcription okay so that you know one of the difference uh, or you can say two differences so in first courses when uh, you know uh, the information from dna that is being transmitted or uh, transcribed in terms of uh, rna and in this particular case that rna is called as messenger rna the short form of that is mrna messenger rna mrna and rna is basically you can say the uh, in this case in this process rna is the bridge between the genes and proteins that they encode over here firstly we are talking about the bacterial cell and now remember in the bacterial cell there is no aspect in the dna and all that information just inside the cell there is it's in the cytoplasm there is nothing as such you know nuclear uh, compartment or something there is no nuclear envelope over there and from mrna what happens is further this information is being translated and this translation uh, is in this process translation is basically synthesis of polypeptide chain using the information in the mrna so you have the mrna that mrna is going to get interacted with the ribosome and so what happens is this mrna gets inside the ribosome and inside the ribosome you have a, a different mechanism you, the basically on the mrna you can say there is a codon and there would be a trna which is charged with the charge means it will have i mean it's not like a electrostatic charge over there but the trna charge when you say trna is charged with the amino acid that means trna will have a particular amino acid at the end of uh, the basic structure so and uh, uh, that is what you know basically the trna will have the anti codon and that anti codon will read the code and if anti codon and Uh, there is a match between codon and anti codon then the uh, uh, amino acid which attached to the rna that will basically get into the ribosome and then the next code comes and next codon comes then there would be uh, uh, there has to be proper and uh, rna coming over there to read that codon and then what happens is uh, the previous amino acid will get attached to this uh, new coming uh, amino acid and then there would be a synthesis of polypeptide bond and such there would be many many polypeptide bonds uh, and with that there would be polypeptide and this polypeptide is nothing but the initial protein and this polypeptide will get into the uh, secondary structure and ternary structure and quaternary structure Uh, so there would be different folding involved over there again uh, you know the energy principles are uh, used over there uh, you know the molecule when you think about it uh, it's just a big molecule but then it could get uh, uh, minimized uh, it it would you know uh, minimize in terms of the energy and it would try to go into the lowest form of the energy and then uh, the protein will form so that is the process of the transcription and uh, and in this bacterial cell uh, the bacterial particular bacterial cell the translation can be concurrent with the transcription what means that what that means is in the bacteria in the bacterial cell the transcription and translation the both processes can go hand in hand can happen at same time so this is about the prokaryotic or this is about the bacterial cell the process in the uh, process in the uh, eukaryotic cell is little different and uh, you know over here what you see is the polyribosome this is the cartoon depiction and this is the uh, electron micrograph of uh, how this you know the ribosome can interact with the mrna so on single strand of mrna you see there are multiple multiple ribosomes and that you know since you have multiple ribosomes then it is called as polyribosome 
and uh, this is the five prime end of the mrna this is three prime end of the uh, uh, mrna and this mrna has essentially same gene right same uh, this is same information and that information is being decoded by uh, ribosome molecule and you you can see if at all you know on the single chain of mrna there are different ribosomes essentially they will produce same protein and in this case uh, what you infer is that this particular single mrna at a time there could be four proteins making exactly you know the same protein the four copies of protein are being made Uh, I mean, this is you know first, second, third, and fourth. And uh, then you know once it is uh, the polypeptide is done, uh, then you know there is a stop codon, and with the stop codon, the whole process of uh, polypeptide you know making that that stop. And uh, then you know the, the peptide is being released into the cytoplasm. And what the process happens? Now uh, at at the, you know this end, five prime end, uh, the ribosome the subunit can attach. and then you know the process can go on so and this is what this picture is uh, you can see you know the line over here that is mrna and uh, the other things over here the big things over here those are nothing but uh, you know some kind of globular or some kind of uh, circular structure also that is called as those are fibers and uh, in this case you know in in case of uh, bacteria the you know the as i said and the transcription and transcription process can go hand in hand that is what is this from here so what this one what we show here uh, see see here this is the you know the faint line over here that is nothing but dna and that is shown over in the cartoon figure uh, below uh, it's uh, shown in the uh, yellow uh, shown in the uh, blue color and at the you know this nodes this nodes are nothing but rna polymerase and that is basically you know from dna the rna uh, mrna is being synthesized over here and on each uh, mrna you see multiple ribosomes or you can say poly uh, ribosomes also uh, and then uh, that is what exactly seen here you know this faint line is nothing but uh, dna and the nodes over here at the each node there is a rna polymerase and uh, the you know you see dot 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 and within that dot you can see a faint line and that faint line is nothing but your mrna and uh, this is your you know this is five prime end of the mrna this is the prime end of the mrna and uh, and this you, you can see you know many many uh, uh, copies of uh, ribosome uh, you know many many copies of the proteins are being made over here now coming back to the transcription in uh, eukaryotic that is a little different situation over here and in this particular case uh, what happens is uh, because what uh, you have the nuclear envelope and the transcription uh, the process of uh, you know getting the information from dna to rna that happens inside this nuclear envelope and uh, you know there has to be some kind of check and balances uh, because uh, the mrna has to come out of this uh, out of this uh, nuclear envelope and it has to get protected and you know that is you know the process is little bit fine right? so uh, that's why you know you have first pre mrna and then in the second step you have the uh, you know mrna and in this case mrna is modified uh, through rna processing to yield uh, finished mrna Uh, and there is you can say there is some kind of protection involved over here so uh, you know basically uh, the whole machinery in the eukaryotic cell is a little different than the bacteria uh, and how exactly the codons are uh, have to be read uh, you know uh, the ribosome complexes uh, they are little different um, i don't want to get into uh, that you know particular detail but then uh, there is you know certain differences are there that's what i want to say and uh, you know uh, then you know the second process is you know second uh, process is translation and again in translation what happens what of the end rna code is there that is being this mrna is being in interaction with the ribosome and with that with that you know you will get the polypeptide and uh, then you know that that the ribosome is in the cytoplasm you remember in the first i think uh, second lecture also what we uh, discussed is there is a nuclear envelope 
And just to add this into a nuclear envelope, you have the endoplasmic reticulum, and you have smooth and uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum. You have rough endoplasmic reticulum. The ribosome will sit on the rough endop endoplasmic reticulum, and that's where the things are, you know, uh, over there. I mean, you can see uh, those are, you know, basically synthesis sites uh, for the different biomolecules. Uh, the there could be lipid formation and all those things uh, which is happening on the smooth ribosome, but uh, in the case of uh, uh, rough uh, endoplasmic reticulum, it's basically the ribosome are sitting over there. And in case of butyrate, you have to you know understand that uh, the nuclear envelope will separate the transcription process from the transcription. That's uh, one of the uh, bigger differences. And when you think about the RNA processing over there, the, the when you think about the you know the transcription, RNA processing, and transcription, over uh, you know DNA will have many genes, and uh, over here you know you you see one part of the gene, uh, and you know. And then you have the exon one, intron, exon two, intron, exon three, and so on. The exon and intron, uh, although you know it's a, it's a part of the DNA, but uh, there are very subtle differences over here. Very major differences. Okay. Exons, these are basically you can say coding coding region, and introns, these are non-coding region. Which means Whatever there is in exon, that is going to get expressed. So basically, this particular exon uh, that will uh, give me, you know, this domain one, which is shown in the domain one of the protein, this particular protein, which is shown in the green color. And then there is the intron. The intron will not have as such effect, but then I think, uh, you know, and, and there are some regulatory mechanisms, and that's why there is some, you know, even though there is no code involved as such, uh, but still that gap is there. And then it comes the exon 2. The exon 2 is shown over here is in the orange color. And then, you know, there would be, uh, you know, this, uh, this is domain 2. And uh, there is basically, you know, with the exons, you have the, uh, uh, you have this, uh, this attachment from uh, domain 1 and uh, domain 2 when, when it gets expressed. And similarly, exon 3, which is shown in the purple. So, uh, the introns, you know, they as such they won't contribute in in terms of the uh, the protein uh, formation. Uh, that particular gene is not going to be uh, no useful. Uh, that particular uh, part of the gene, but uh, exon, that particular part of the gene is being expressed in terms of uh, protein formation or polypeptide formation. Um, and uh, this, you know, I mean, this is you know little. Uh, Again, you know, when you have, uh, you know, when you think about the bacterial cell versus, uh, you know, prokaryotic cell versus uh, eukaryotic cell, you can say, you know, both cell will have its uh, functionality, but then, uh, in case of eukaryotic, you have kind of compartmentalization. And because of that, uh, these regulatory mechanisms could be done. And, you know, overall, when you think about this, I will, you know, I'm just going to finish the lecture within a couple of minutes and then I can answer your question. When you think about the, uh, you know, overall the central dogma, this is what the flow chart uh, flow looks like. From DNA, the information is being transcribed, uh, or that process called transcription. From DNA, it is become, uh, you know, RNA. And from RNA to protein, that information is being, being translated. And the process is called translation. Uh, but, you know, uh, this central dogma theory, you know, initially it was like this, uh, basically it's a concept uh, that basically tells you uh, about the cell, how the uh, cellular chain of command has to be followed. And, uh, you know, regularly we will see, you know, uh, in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell, uh, there could be a regular mechanism from DNA to RNA, that is transcription process, and from RNA, RNA to protein, that is transcription process. But then when you Think about, uh, you know, the viruses particle, viruses, as such, you know, as such, you know, you have virus particle, as such it is not, uh, you know, you can say, uh, dead or alive. But then, when virus comes in contact with uh, the host cell, then it can get activated. And typically, our, uh, these viruses uh, may have the RNA as their, their material, uh, inside their capsule. And this, you know, the viruses has a, you know, different process. What they do is they use the host mechanism. And in order to use that host mechanism, 
this RNA which is being in the in the uh, uh, in the uh, virus uh, that you know first will get converted into DNA. That process called as reverse transcription. And then you know with that process, if, when it synthesizes the DNA, then it will basically act. You know, then it will have transcription process and then translation process. And that is why you know, if at all some you know you get infection, viral infection, you will see uh, you will have you know at a time you might feel uh, low, you will have high uh, fever or so uh, because what is happening is essentially you are you know the uh, viruses uh, those are being you know they are using your uh, all metabolic activity and they are using that uh, metabolic activity to replicate themselves and then your body is resistant there are you know a lot of antibody mechanisms are involved so overall you know you are you know you need a lot of lot of uh, you can say metabolic activities and uh, you might be because of you know unnecessary development uh, happening uh, because of the viruses uh, you are deficient of uh, uh, you know energy currency also and that's where you know uh, you feel uh, low you, you feel less energetic and, and all those things so uh, yeah so basically this is called as uh, you know uh, from RNA to DNA, that is very special case. Uh, that is called as reverse transcription. And so basically, this is you know, and the last part is gen genetic code and mutation, which I will you know try to finish in the couple of minutes. I don't have much time. Um, but you know, in case of DNA, you think about you, you have A, C, G, uh, G, C. These are four letters, four characters, or you know, the four uh, bases are there. But in case of protein, there are 20 letters, or you can say there are 20 bases, and these 20 bases are nothing but your amino acids. And uh, you can have, you know, the, the genetic code uh, possibly in terms of, you know, all those four or 20 letters. The question was whether the genetic code is being passed from the DNA or protein. And initial uh, base was with this protein, but then, you know, basically, with experiments, series of experiments, and when people basically got to know more about the uh, DNA, then you know uh, it, it was uh, you know confirmed that DNA is indeed the genetic material. And in, process, in, in the basically transcription process, you have this you know mRNA, and mRNA has this codon, and each codon basically is made of three uh, nucleo nucleotides, U, G, G. This UGG will have the amino acid, particular amino acid expressed as, uh, you know, cytosine, and then the UGG that will have the single alumin, then GGC, you have the glycine, and so on. So basically, uh, there is a possible combination, and then, you know, some, uh, basically, you know, the particular over here, the uh, code AUG, that is very specific, and that is for the mutual, that is the starting of the a protein synthesis and every protein synthesis, every protein synthesis, no matter it is eukaryotic or prokaryotic, you will see the starting codon is a U G. And in case of top codon, then you have to basically stop the protein synthesis. That is basically you have these three codons: U A A, U A G, and U G A. And in between, you might have a different codons, and depending upon that, you have uh, you know different uh, uh, you know depending upon what is the combination and all those things. Uh, there would be uh, typical expression. So in this case, you know, uh, you have the U U U, and you see both codons will have single amino as your amino acid, and U A U U A and U U G will have U C. So there is a particular chart which is uh, given in the uh, book. Uh, you can you know have a book uh, later on, and this is basically when you think about that, that is uh, figure 17.5. You can have a look over there. Uh, what is the basically uh, the particular uh, code and for that particular code what would be the amino acid and, and that is mentioned over there. But interesting thing, you know, let's say if at all there is a mutation. So this is the third position over here. And uh, if at all in the third position over here, that is called an you know, uh, oval position. And this is, you know, this particular geraffing is being, uh, you know, mitigated to uh, everything also. And in that case, the code will be, codon will be UUC, uh, but then still it is expressing single LLM. And uh, then in this case, the mutation is called as silent, as if there is no difference in the amino acid. So that's why the mutation is being called as silent. But then, when you have the mutation in the first 
put on over here from let's say u u u to g u u then in that case it will have a value and there is a basically mix thing and there is value in place of single one because this particular mutation will be a mix thing and uh, why you know sometimes you know it's very important because let's say in y type uh, you know hemoglobin uh, you have uh, the cell shape something like round and in sickle cell sickle cell hemoglobin you have the cell shape which is you know some kind of uh, you can say uh this you know uh, this thing but in this you know mutant uh, the sickle cell is nothing but there is a mutation at particular location so in this you know the five time location over here you have gsg and uh, in that basically if you have the gug and in that gug case what happens is you have this balance instead of glutamine now in sickle cell we have this balance and that changes this you know surface properties of this cell cell uh, red blood red blood cell uh, in this in this case and that you know that could result in this kind of shape of this uh, rbc and uh, then you know with this reduction then you know uh, it has uh, less capacity to uh, carry the oxygen and then person will fight uh, you know feel anemic and all that so uh, that is you know then you have the non sense mutation and uh, then you know the non sense basically is uh, protein synthesis stop uh, where the protein synthesis stop that is uh, term as that mutation is term as non sense so u u u a to and then u u a u a a these are basically you know you have the u a a that is a stop codon uh, so mutation this particular mutation will you know u u a that is for the leucine and now if it is mutated to u a a then it will have the uh, stop codon and and you know stop in between so this is called as one thing and now i think you know i will stop here and now i can take the uh, question yes any question Yes. Uh, sir, if AUG always has to be present at the start of the uh, yes. DNA chain, does that mean all proteins? No, 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 not AUG or DNA. Ah, AUG, AUG. Ah, that is on the mRNA. AUG, this is on mRNA. Okay. Not on DNA. DNA has a different code. This is the DNA code over here. And ATG will have AUG. Uh, sorry, EAC will have AUG. Okay. And it will be basically. It has to have, you know. So in order to have, how the how does basically how does uh, the protein synthesis will start? You have, you know, lock up code on the mRNA, and uh, the mRNA code doesn't start. just with uh, methionine there is you know before methionine there could be and that is where i don't didn't uh, explain it little bit uh, those are you know certain differences in case of bacteria and uh, the eukaryotic so uh, there is you know there are specific sites where the mrna sits inside the ribosome and there are the site has to be recognized by uh, the ribosome and that is where the subtle difference is there and uh, what could happen is in fact the ribosome uh, once you know uh, you know before this aug there would be a lot of other codon but then uh, when this aug particularly comes in that uh, that that zone zone you can say zone in the 30s ribosome or small sub unit uh, then and then you know the process of protein synthesis can start so every time the first I mean, acid. No matter it is prokaryotic or eukaryotic, the first I mean, acid would be methionine. Okay. Any question? Ma'am, sir. Yes, sir. So all protein chains will start with methionine. Yes, by default. Okay. Yeah. Any more question? Yes. Nice. Sir, I wanted to ask regarding the sickle cell anemia. Mm-hmm. Sir, 
uh, in that the uh, coding will change in each and every cell or in just a single cell. Coding will change in each and every cell. Yes. That means uh, how how will it, how will it happen, sir? So the thing is that you know now you think about you know person. Yeah. Every person has this DNA. That mutation is happen in the DNA itself. Okay, it is not on the mRNA level. So that you know the, the mutation is on the DNA level itself. And because of that, the person by default, you know, you have that, you know, uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know where exactly this which chromosome this gene is located, but then, uh, you know, if it is the, on the mutation is on the DNA level, it is basically individual uh, that is being faced with that, you know, the, uh, disease, and these are, you know, some kind of uh, hereditary diseases. Shall I get transmitted from uh, from the main DNA chain only, right? Ah, uh, yes, but then, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the thing is that at a time what would happen is how the crossing over, I mean, remember last time when we talked about this meiosis and mitosis. Hmm. So mito, uh, meiosis has this crossing over. And uh, during that, you know, uh, I, I think the first thing is that either parents could have, I mean, one of the parents could have sickle, sickle cell. Now I don't remember whether it's, uh, it is a male parent or female parent. I don't remember about that. Uh, I think uh, that uh, will be caught in the, uh, you know, uh, in the uh, your tutorial session. But then uh, this is, you know, most commonly. Uh, inherited disorder, uh, you know, this is in the uh, Africa, and, and I think uh, in uh, India there are, I think, uh, part of India, uh, probably in the Nagpur region also, we have a lot of sickle cell, uh, uh, you know, uh, patients. So uh, this is, you know, uh, I mean, I, again, I don't remember whether it is from the male or female or maybe both. Uh, Parent person, which is for basically, uh, yeah, I mean, and there are different types of, uh, you know, sickle cell. Uh, so, if you have to homo, in, in case of homozygote and in case of heterozygote, uh, you know, in, let's say heterozygote may show some symptoms, but, you know, the, uh, they might not have a particular, you know, spread. So, many things are there, which I, I don't remember at this point. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any other question? Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, then we can stop here. And just remember that on uh, uh, your tutorial session, next tutorial session, that would be okay. Uh, thank you. And next, come next week, uh, uh, Professor Sujit Srilaj and I are going to see you. Next model of the uh, MC. Thank you.